Good evening, my dear friends and colleagues. Today, we will talk about one of the most important topics in nephrology, which is IgA nephropathy. This is our agenda. IgA nephropathy is a mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. It is the most common GN presented by that presentation. When you say IgA nephropathy, remember mesangial proliferation. And it is characterized from its name by mesangial, mesangial deposition of IgA. It's called IgA nephropathy. So there is IgA deposition in the glomerulus, where in the, mainly in the mesangium. IgA nephropathy was first recognized in 1968 by Berger when immune fluorescence techniques were first introduced in renal biopsy specimens and then diagnosed IgA nephropathy and it has its name, Berger disease. IgA is unique among the glomerular disease as it is defined by the presence of immune reactant. The main, the main point in diagnosing IgA nephropathy is the presence of IgA deposition in the mesangium. And also IgA nephropathy carries its importance from being it is the most prevalent pattern of glomerular disease. It is the most common glomerular nephritis worldwide. This is very important. It is very common. It is very common IgA nephropathy. It is the most common or the most prevalent pattern of glomerular disease worldwide, either in Western countries or in Asian countries. Let's talk about the etiology and pathogenesis. The majority of IgA, either IgA A1 and 2, is produced by plasma cells and freely circulates in the circulation. In IgA nephropathy, what is the abnormality? In IgA nephropathy, there is abnormal, abnormal, glycosylated, this is very important, glycosylated polymeric IgA A1. The abnormality here in IgA nephropathy is mainly in the IgA1 due to abnormal glycosylation. So it is mainly abnormally glycosylated polymeric IgA1, which has a tendency for self-aggregation and complex formation, and then it is deposited in the glomerular mesangium. So again, it is due to abnormal glycosylation of IgA1 with increasing tendency to deposition in the mesangium. But this this abnormality alone is not enough. It needs co-deposition by complement and IgG to increase the severity and cause the disease. Why it, why it is mainly IgA1 over IgA2? Because it is mainly due to abnormal glycosylation of O-linked, as we said, abnormal glycosylation of the O-linked polysaccharides that are unique to the hinge region of IgA1. This is unique to IgA1 over IgA2 due to abnormal glycosylation of the O-linked polysaccharides that, that present in the hinge region of IgA1. This is very important. IgA binding to the mesangial receptors lead to mesangial cell activation and mesangial cell proliferation with recruitment of the inflammatory cells. Infections, particularly mucosal infections, especially upper respiratory tract infections and the hypersensitivity are suggested precipitant to IgA nephropathy. Again, as we said, the striking feature of IgA nephropathy is abnormal glycosylation of the hinge region of IgA1. IgA1 has a distinctive O-linked sugars at its hinge region, as we said before. IgA2 has no hinge and has no such sugars. 
circulating IgA1 in IgA nephropathy has abnormal O-linked hinge region sugars with reduced galactosy galactosylation. As we said, there is abnormal galactosylation of the IgA1. So it is named galactose deficient, galactose deficient IgA1. It is present in 90% of individuals with IgA nephropathy. Let's talk about an important area, which is the serum IgA levels. Serum IgA levels are increased in only one third of patients with IgA nephropathy. This is a very common question. And never to forget that serum IgA levels are increased in only one third of patients with IgA nephropathy. In only one third. High serum IgA itself is not sufficient, is not sufficient to cause IgA nephropathy. And the serum IgA levels are not useful, are not useful for diagnosis Ig for diagnosing IgA nephropathy. This is a very important note and never to forget that serum IgA levels are not useful for diagnosing IgA nephropathy. We don't rely on Ig in serum IgA levels to diagnose IgA nephropathy. What about the epidemiology of IgA nephropathy? IgA nephropathy has marked heterogeneity in its clinical and pathological features. IgA differs across ethnic populations around the world. It is the most prevalent glomerular fights, as we said and more likely to cause kidney failure in people of East Asian ancestry. This is an important, this is an important question. Asian people has the highest risk of complications and kidney deterioration from IgA nephropathy, and they has they has the worst prognosis. East Asians followed by Caucasians and it is rare in African descent it is rare in African this is controversial to or opposite to focal segmental focal segmental is more common in African plaques here IgA nephropathy is rare in African but it is more common and with higher risk of deterioration in Asian uh, population IgA nephropathy is more common in males than females with a ratio of 3 to 1, but this ratio decreases to 1 to 1 in Asian population. So in white populations, it is 3 to 1, while in Asian population, it is 1 to 1. Now we will talk about the clinical manifestations, and we will start by macroscopic hematuria which is the main presentation of IgA nephropathy, macroscopic hematuria. What is meant by macroscopic? That's obvious by eye. In 40 to 50 percent of patients, the clinical presentation is episodic or recurrent attacks of macroscopic hematuria. That's most frequently in the second decade. The urine is usually brown and clots are unusual. There might be loin pain caused by renal capsular swelling. Hematuria usually follows intercurrent mucosal infections typically in the upper respiratory tract. So hematuria follows the upper respiratory tract infections. The term synpharyngetic, remember that term, synpharyngetic hematuria has been used Sin pharyngetic, that this hematuria follows that upper respiratory tract infections or occasionally in the GIT tract. Usually, this hematuria is usually visible within 24 hours, within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms of that infection. It's very important. The time period is very important to differentiate between IgA nephropathy and 
post-infectious gromenonephritis or post-streptococcal gromenonephritis. So hematuria follows up respiratory tract infections by 24 hours. Again, as we said, differentiating it from the two to three week delay between infection and subsequent hematuria in post-infectious or post-streptococcal gomerulonephritis. This macroscopic hematuria usually resolves spontaneously, spontaneously without any intervention over a few days. But microscopic hematuria might persist between the attacks. So the main presentation of IgA nephropathy is macroscopic hematuria following an upper respiratory tract infection within a period of 24 hours. Again, it is usually presented by from asymptomatic coronary abnormality or microscopic hematuria. Hematuria might be macroscopic, as we said, after upper respiratory tract infection named synpharyngetic hematuria what about proteinuria proteinuria is common with IgA nephropathy but nephrotic range proteinuria with more than 3 grams per day is unusual and less than 15% of case so it's proteinuria is usually not not nephrotic range proteinuria and nephrotic range proteinuria is unusual presentation of IgA nephropathy It usually starts in young adults. Hypertension is common and often difficult to control. IgA nephropathy might also present with RBGN and AKI. Extra renal manifestations, including purpuric skin rash, can occur and it might be overlapped with henoxial line purpur. An important issue is that there are some diseases that are associated with IgA nephropathy. Diseases that are associated with IgA nephropathy. They are classified to commonly associated or reported cases with reported association with IgA nephropathy and rare diseases to be associated with IgA nephropathy. The most important or the common, the common disease, disease that are commonly associated with IgA nephropathy, and they are highlighted here from the rheumatic disease, the most important is ankylosing spondylitis. From the GIT, of course, celiac disease, hepatic disease, the most important is alcoholic liver disease, sarcoidosis, skin disease dermatitis herpetiform these are the diseases that are commonly associated with IgA nephropathy and this is a common question in the exams diseases that that are reported to be associated with IgA nephropathy include basic disease takayasu ulcerative colitis IgA monoclonal gammopathies and brucellosis Rare disease to be associated with IgA nephropathy include Sika syndrome, Crohn's, pulmonary hemosiderosis, and renal carcinoma. But don't forget common diseases. Now let's talk about the pathology. About the pathology. In light microscopy, of course, the main effect, the main pathological presentation is mesangial cell proliferation mesangial cell proliferation and increased mesangial matrix but immune staining of course include mesangial IgA deposition mainly IgA with complement 3 there it might be possible co-deposition of IgG and IgM but the main immunoglobulin deposition must be IgA in electron microscopy, there, of course, there is mesangial deposition near the bottom mesangial glomerular basement membrane. Diffuse mesangial IgA is the defining hallmark of IgA nephropathy. Never to forget that. When I said IgA nephropathy, I meant diffuse mesangial IgA deposition. 
Comblem 3 is codibosin in, in up to 90% of cases, IgA is present in 40% and IgM in 40% of cases. IgA might be also deposited along the capillary loops, a pattern that's more common in IgA vasculitis and is associated with worse prognosis. Pathology is of an important value in predicting the prognosis in predicting the prognosis of patient with IgA nephropathy. The Oxford MIST classification, Oxford MIST classification of IgA nephropathy is now being widely accepted. And MIST is abbreviation for M for mesangial hypercellularity. E for endocabillary hypercellularity, S for segmental sclerosis, and T for tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. And there is more updated classification called MEST C classification for this Oxford. Oxford MEST C classification and C for crescent cellular or fibrocellular crescent. So we can, from pathology, we can use the MIST C classification to classify the renal biopsy, which helps us in, progno in predicting prognosis of patients. Here we found that there is diffuse mesangial, mesangial, IgA deposition by indirect immune fluorescence. Here we found that there is mesangial hypercellularity, mesangial hypercellularity here and here, mesangial hypercellularity. Here we found endocabillary hypercellularity, endocabillary hypercellularity by MIST classification. Here we found S segmental sclerosis, segmental sclerosis, and here by electron microscopy, we found that with the mesangial electron deposits, that the mesangial deposits. What about the differential diagnosis? These are the conditions associated with mesangial IgA deposition. Mesangial IgA deposition. Fourth, IgA nephropathy, IgA vasculitis, lupus, alcoholic liver disease, IgA monoclonal gammopathy, schistosomal nephropathy, and a very important one is IgA dominant staphylococcal associated glomerulonephritis, a pattern of post-infectious glomerulonephritis, post-infectious mainly caused by staphylococci, but it is IgA dominant. This It's more common in diabetics. Let's talk about the diagnosis from the KDGO 2020. This is from KDGO. IgA nephropathy can only, only be diagnosed by a kidney biopsy. We should score the kidney biopsy using the revised Oxford MEST C classification. An important note in the KD guidelines that no validated diagnostic serum or urinary biomarkers to diagnose IgA nephropathy. Again, no, there is no serum till now there is no validated biomarkers to diagnose IgA nephropathy either in serum or urine. We should assess all patients for secondary causes. What about the prognosis? From the key digo, of course. Clinical and histological data at the time of biopsy. Again, 
at the time of biopsy, clinical and histological data can be used to risk assess the patient, to classify the patient using what is called the international IgA nephropathy prediction tool. Again, in prognosis, we can use this, what is called the international IgA nephropathy prediction tool. It is available online. It includes clinical and histological data to risk stratify the patients to assess the prognosis. This tool, international IgA nephropathy prediction tool, cannot, cannot, this is very important, cannot be used to determine or what to choose for treatment cannot be used to choose a specific or a particular treatment regimen and again there is no validated no validated prognostic serum or urinary biomarkers for IgA nephropathy what are the validated the most important used tools to assess the prognosis of patient with IgA nephropathy is estimated GFR and proteinuria. Proteinuria and GFR are the most important tools to, to assess the prognosis of IgA nephropathy. This is the elements present in the international IgA prediction tool. It includes GFR and the proteinuria. These are the most important. And it includes also blood pressure, systolic and diastolic at time of biopsy. Take care of that. At time of biopsy, at biopsy, at biopsy, at biopsy. It includes, of course, age of patient, a race, a race. As we said, Asian population has the worst prognosis. And also the use of ACE inhibitors or ARB at the time of biopsy and the MEST score, MEST, and immunosuppression use, immunosuppression use at the time of biopsy. All of these are included in this tool named the International IgA Nephropathy Prediction Tool. The most importantly are GFR and the proteinuria, blood pressure, like any glomerular disease. Here we add age, race, the use of ACE inhibitors or immunosuppression, and the MIST score. This tool usually can determine can determine a 50% a 50% decline in GFR or kidney failure at selected time interval. This tool, this tool can determine the a 50% decline in GFR or kidney failure at selected time interval. This data should be present at the time of biopsy. We include the data only at the time of biopsy. Also from Comprehensive, the prognostic markers at presentation, take care, at presentation in IgA nephropathy, clinical, clinical markers and histological markers. We'll start by poor prognosis markers or data of poor prognosis includes, of course, hypertension, renal impairment, proteinuria. These are the most important and classical determinant of prognosis in any glomerular disease, the presence of hypertension, renal impairment, and proteinuria. Here we had smoking, hyperuricemia, obesity, long duration of symptoms, age, age, and histological include, as we said, the MIST, MIST classification, Oxford MIST classification, 
increase and there is some controversy about its reliability to determine the prognosis of patients. Of good prognosis, the recurrent macroscopic hematuria, recurrent macroscopic hematuria at presentation is of good prognosis. But conditions that are that have no impact on prognosis include gender and serum IgA level and the intensity of IgA deposition in in biopsy have no impact on prognosis. Now we'll talk about the treatment of IgA nephropathy. I started by this slide or this diagram because I found it it's very practical and very nice to conclude all the treatment strategies in IgA nephropathy. This is from Comprehensive. At first, we classify patients for low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk patients. Low risk patients, patient with micro, micro hematuria and proteinuria, protein is very important, proteinuria less than 0.5 gram and GFR normal and no hypertension. Don't forget that low risk, what are the criteria for low risk patients? Proteinuria less than 0.5 gram, GFR normal and no hypertension. Intermediate risk, proteinuria between 0.5 to 1 gram per day, reduced GFR plus or minus hypertension. High risk patients, characterized by acute or rapid loss of GFR. In low risk patients, annual or biannual monitoring for at least 10 years. We'll discuss later. We should continual monitoring of these low risk patients for at least 10 years. They are at low risk for progression. What about the intermediate risk patients? Proteinuria between 0.5 to 1 gram and reduced G4 and hypertension. We should start by optimizing supportive therapy. We should start by supportive therapy. And we will discuss it in details, this supportive therapy. Supportive therapy for three to six months. It is mainly composed of the use of ACE or ARBs and control hypertension and control proteinuria and dietary sodium restriction. We should give supportive therapy for three to six months. If the GFR after that three to six months GFR is more than 50 and proteinuria and the condition of the patient improves with the proteinuria less than one gram and GFR is stable, we should continue this supportive therapy. But if after these six months, proteinuria persists over one gram and GFR decline, we should continue supportive therapy and add six months course of steroids. So when to use the first condition to use a steroid when in patient with intermediate risk after giving the patient supportive therapy for six months and after six months there is proteinuria more than one gram and GFR declined and the GFR is more than 50. These are the conditions that should be present before giving steroids to patients with IgA nephropathy. I should have given the patient supportive therapy for six months and after six months there is still proteinuria more than one gram and there is deterioration of GFR but the GFR is still more than 50 milli per minute. At this condition I can give add to supportive therapy I can add steroids. But if after six months of supportive therapy, the GFR is between 30 and 50, I should give, 
I should continue supportive therapy. The use of immunosuppression here or the gain from immunosuppression here is doubtful. The risks are for complication are high and the benefits are low. And of course, if the GFR is less than 30, I shouldn't give immunosuppression. I should continue only on supportive therapy. So take care. This is the condition that I can use steroids. Intermediate risk, six months is supportive. After six months, there is no response, but the GFR is more than 50 milli per minute. What about the high risk categories, which are characterized by acute or rapid deterioration of the GFR? If it is the patient present with nephrotic syndrome or crescentic IgA with RBGN, if it is RBGN or nephrotic syndrome, I should give supportive plus immunosuppression. So these are the conditions that can that I can give steroids or immunosuppression. If there is nephrotic syndrome or crescentic with RBGN IgA nephropathy or steroids after, as we said, in these conditions. But if this AKI is due to macrohematuria or other common causes, I should give supportive therapy only. This algorithm or diagram is very important, is very illustrative in the management of IgA nephropathy. What about the key DIGO uh, 2020 recommendations? They recommend that all patients should have their blood pressure managed and the blood pressure should be controlled. If the patient has a proteinuria with this hypertension if the proteinuria is more than 0.5 gram they recommend that the initial therapy is either ACE inhibitors or ARBs but not both also in patient with proteinuria more than 0.5 gram per day irrespective of their blood pressure they should be treated with ACE or ARBs Recommendation three, patients who remain at high risk of progression, at high risk of regression to CKD despite maximal supportive care, as we said, after three to six months course of supportive therapy, and after that they remain having proteinuria of more than one gram or uh, deterioration of GFR, these are called high risk patients. They are considered for a six months course of steroids. But we should take care of toxicity. Particularly in patients, as we said, as we said, in patients with GFR less less than 50 milli per minute. I can should I should give steroids only if the patients have GFR more than 50 milli per minute. What about the practice points? Practice point in these KDEGO guidelines. Considerations for all patients with IgA nephropathy. The primary focus should be on optimizing supportive care. Supportive care must be applied for all patients with IgA nephropathy. We should assess the cardiovascular risk. We should give lifestyle advice. The most important is dietary sodium restriction, smoking cessation, weight control, and exercise. Other than dietary sodium restriction, no specific dietary intervention has been shown to alter the outcome in IgA nephropathy. There are variant forms of IgA nephropathy, include IgA deposition with minimal chain disease, and we'll discuss it later and IgA with AKI and IgA with RBGN. This is an algorithm for
from the KD guidelines about the initial assessment and management, initial assessment and management of patients with IgA nephropathy. If I have a patient with IgA dominant glomerulonephritis, I should exclude, I should exclude secondary causes, including IgA vasculitis, IgA nephropathy secondary to HIV or hepatitis or uh, IBD or autoimmune disease or liver cirrhosis or IgA dominant uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis. If I exclude these secondary causes and the patients are diagnosed as having Ig idiopathic IgA nephropathy, I should score the kidney biopsy using the MIST-C, Oxford MIST-C score, and then risk stratify the patient using the international IgA, nephro uh, IgA nephropathy prediction tool. So I score the kidney and risk stratify the patient. And then I should commence and start the supportive care for all patients, including blood pressure management, maximally tolerated doses of ACE or ARBs, lifestyle modifications, and address the cardiovascular risk. This is very important about the initial assessment and management of patients with IgA nephropathy. Patients who are at high risk of IgA progression we talked about them but they are defined as having patient with proteinuria persistent proteinuria of more than one gram despite treatment with a maximal tolerated or allowed dose of RAS blockade for a minimum of three months minimum minimum of three months it is allowed to three to six months but a minimum of three months These patients, as we said, they are defined as having proteinuria more than one gram per day. After this maximally tolerated dose of ACE or ARBs for at least three months, can be prolonged to six months. Immunosuppressive drugs should only be considered in these in these patients who are at high risk of progression, despite this maximal supportive care. In all patients in whom immunosuppression is considered before applying or giving immunosuppression, a detailed discussion of the risks and benefits for each drug should be undertaken with the patient, with a recognition that adverse treatment effects are more likely if the patient has a GFR less, less, less than 50 milli per day. Don't forget that number of GFR, GFR less than 50, we should take care of the side effects and of treatment with immunosuppression of steroids. As we said before, there is insufficient evidence to support the use of Oxford MIST C score in determining which immunosuppression to be given. We shouldn't apply or rely on the Oxford classification to choose a particular treatment regimen. Of course, again, as we said, treatment decisions shouldn't shouldn't be uh, uh, mean determ determined upon the presence of crescent we shouldn't use crescent to choose a particular treatment decision as you said also before the international iga prediction tool cannot be used to determine a particular treatment regimen dynamic assessment over time for the patient to determine which immunosuppression should be given. Multiple observational registry studies demonstrate that sustained proteinuria, sustained proteinuria is the most powerful predictor of long-term kidney outcome. The most important prognostic marker in IgA nephropathy is persistent proteinuria. What about steroids? What about steroids? As we said before, clinical benefit of steroids on IgA nephropathy is not established, is not established, and should be given with extreme caution and should be avoided entirely in the following situation. We shouldn't give steroids in these patients. 
in patients with GFR less than 30, in diabetes, obesity, latent infections like viral hepatitis or TB, secondary diseases like cirrhosis, in active peptic ulceration and uncontrolled psychiatric illness. In these patients, we shouldn't give steroids. These are the steroid regimens used in different clinical trials with the use of RAS inhibitors. Testing studies they give mesidprednisolone. In nano trials they give prednisolone one milligram per kg per day with the duration. And then here is the tapering and the total exposure of steroids different six to eight months six months and eight months there is no data to support the effects or reduce success of alternate day steroids or those reduced protocols this is also another algorithm about the treatment or the management of patients who are at high risk of progression on whose patient with proteinuria more than one gram despite three months of optimized supportive care of blood pressure management and maximal dose as we said of or obese lifestyle modifications if there is persistent proteinuria one more than one gram after at least at least three months can be prolonged up to six months of supportive care and there is still persistent proteinuria we should look for the gfr if the gfr is less than 30 we should consider supportive therapy continuous supportive therapy but if the gfr is more than, more than 30 i can i can think of steroids but i shouldn't give steroids in these conditions as we said before if these conditions are not present especially if the gfr is more than 50 more than 50 i can give steroids for six months what about the other treatment other other agents in iga nephropathy Antiplatelet agents are not recommended, anticoagulant not recommended, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, calcineri, rituximab are not recommended, all of them. Fish oils are not recommended, but patients who wish to take fish oils should be advised of the dose and formulations used in the published clinical trials, but overall they are not recommended. What about the MMF? The MMF in Chinese population and non-Chinese population. In the Chinese populations, an MMF can be used as in patients who in patients who took steroids can be used as a steroid sparing agents. In a single randomized control trial conducted in China. MMF with low dose steroid was non inferior to standard dose steroids for the treatment of patients with proliferative lesions uh, with IgA nephropathy. So, in a Chinese population, in a Chinese population, we, MMF can be used with low dose steroid, but in non Chinese patients, there is insufficient evidence to support the use of MMF. What about tonsillectomy? Tonsillectomy. Tonsillectomy shouldn't be performed as a treatment for IgA nephropathy in Caucasian patients. Tonsillectomy may be indicated in some national in some national guidelines for the treatment of recurrent tonsillitis in patients with IgA nephropathy. Multiple studies from Japan from Japan have reported improved kidney survival and remission of hematuria and proteinuria following tonsillectomy alone or with pulsed steroids. So there is this is some regional use of tonsillectomy as a treatment and IgA nephropathy in Japanese 
it is performed routinely often with pulse steroid but in a Chinese it is not routinely performed and also in Caucasian the, it is not performed so tonsillectomy is usually done in Japan but not uh, in other populations what about IgA presented with nephrotic syndrome as we said nephrotic syndrome is usually present in less than 15 percent of patients it is not a common presentation it is a rare presentation it is you it is mainly thought as a budocytopathy resembling minimal change disease patient with a kidney biopsy demonstrating mesangial IgA deposition and light and electron microscopic features consistent with minimal chain disease should be treated in accordance with the guidelines for minimal chain disease you should be treated as minimal change disease and also patient with nephrotic syndrome he has who has a mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis should be managed in the same way as patient with at high risk for progressive kidney disease nephrotic range proteinuria without nephrotic syndrome can be seen in IgA nephropathy and this commonly reflects a coexistent secondary FSGS or it is just a, a continuation of the disease or a progression of the disease itself with extensive glomerulosclerosis and tubular interstitial fibrosis IgA nephropathy with AKI AKI can happen especially in patients with severe visible hematuria that's commonly associated with upper respiratory tract infection a repeat kidney biopsy should be considered in patients who fail to show improvement in kidney functions within two weeks of cessation of this hematuria so we should do a kidney biopsy if there is no improvement of kidney functions within two weeks of stoppage of hematuria of course immediate management of AKI with visible hematuria should focus on supportive care for AKI AKI might be due to either de novo or during a natural history due to RBGN with crescent formation in the, in the absence of visible hematuria and when reversible causes have been excluded like drug toxicity or pre and post kidney causes a kidney biopsy should be performed as soon as possible if the patient is suspected to have an RBGN better so these are the conditions when to perform a kidney biopsy in a patient with IgA nephropathy presented with AKI IgA nephropathy might present with rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis which is defined as more than 50% decline in the GFR over three months or less when reversible causes have been excluded. So when I define a patient as having RBGN IgA nephropathy, when there is 50% or more decline in the GFR over a period of three months or less, kidney biopsy is essential the presence of crescent kidney biopsy in the absence of concomitant change in the serum creatinine doesn't constitute RBGN it is it is not an absolute indication we suggest they suggest that patient with RBGN IgA nephropathy should be treated with cyclophosphamide and steroids in accordance with the guidelines for treatment of ANCA associated vasculitis you should be treated like ANCA associated vasculites with steroids and cyclophosphamide there is insufficient data to support the use of rituximab 
for the treatment of rapidly progressive IgA nephropathy. So it should be treated with cyclophosphamide and steroids. What about IgA nephropathy in children? General considerations inclu include that visible hematuria is more frequent in children. Children usually have a higher GFR, a lower proteinuria, and more erythrocyturia. Kidney biopsy in children is usually performed at presentations with hematuria, proteinuria, and normal C3 to confirm to confirm the diagnosis. Treatment treatment of children there is a strong evidence suggesting that a, there is a benefit of RAS blockade in children in a children with proteinuria more than one gram and mesangial hypercellularity usually most pediatric nephrologists will treat with steroids plus supportive care and in children with rapidly progressive IgA nephropathy like adult steroids can be used with oral cyclophosphamide. This is a reminder of this beautiful algorithm for the treatment of IgA nephropathy, low risk patient monitoring, intermediate risk max supportive therapy for three to six months. Again, we should reassess for the proteinuria and GFR and hypertension. If there is persistent, if there is persistent proteinuria and GFR more than 50, I can use a steroid. This is where I can use steroids. But if the GFR less than 50 or less than 30, the usage of steroid is not preferred. In high risk patients, especially nephrotic and crescentic IgA nephropathy, we can use immunosuppression with supportive therapy. This is our sources and thank you.